everyone, and welcome to At Katie Couric. You know, as a child, she was booted from her school choir after a teacher told her she sounded like a goat. Well, today, Shakira has sold more than 50 million albums worldwide, so I guess she showed that teacher. I talked to her for the January issue of Glamour magazine about her career, her philanthropy, and yes, about those hips that don't lie. Here's my interview, and as always, a big thank you to our sponsor, Dove. All right, so Shakira, I wanted to start by asking you, what is your first memory of singing? In the car with my family, uh, going to the beach, which is something that is almost sacred. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost a, uh, one of those habits that become religious. You right. Know? You have to go to, sun, to, to, to the beach every Sunday when you live in, in, in a coastal city like Barranquilla, my hometown, where I was born and raised. So I remember going to the beach with my parents and, and singing, singing along with them. And I also remember vividly my dad turning back to me and, while well, he was driving. <laughs> that wasn't <laughs> very, very good. Very wise thing. Yeah. <laughs> and, and saying, oh, wow, the, the, our little girl, she has an amazing, really powerful voice. He was telling my mother, Listen, listen, listen to her voice. It's really, really powerful. And I'm like, he said the word potente, which potent, which in, in my head, I, I didn't even know what potente meant, you know, powerful. And um, it kind of st stuck to my head, that, that word. And, and uh, so that's, that's my first singing memory. Or, How old were you? Or the you? moment in which I, I feel that I discovered my voice. How old were you? Do I was you remember? probably five, six years old. Um, and then later on, when I was eight, I remember writing my first songs and, and yeah, discovering the possibility of, of, of putting together a melody to, to my thoughts. You know. And that and first song came from a place of real grief and anguish, didn't it? That's, how, that's what I figured out later on in, in my life, through therapy actually. <laughs> yeah, I, I figured out that um, that first song uh, it was, it was called uh, your, your, your Dark Sunglasses. And I figured out that I had written that song to my dad's pain and grief, the grief that he was carrying behind, or trying to hide behind his, his sunglasses. And that song actually made it to my first uh, album, uh, which was released when I was 13. Tell us why your dad was so grief stricken. Um, he, he lost his oldest son. Uh, when I was two years old, and that's actually the first memory I have from my life. Mm. He was in a motorcycle. Yeah, accident? he was in a motorcycle accident. So this was your your older brother. My oldest brother, yeah, um, yeah. And I remember vividly the the, the the phone call and and my mother answering the phone and my mother starting to cry, though he wasn't his her son. I'm sorry. Um, I'm the only child in my mother's marriage, but. I have um, many siblings from my dad's first marriage, and and he was his yeah his oldest son, and and um, and my dad never really fully recovered, you know, from, from that. Sure. I guess that writing that first song was the beginning of uh, um, a catharsis for me. How did it help you heal the process of of observing your dad and then putting it putting pen to paper and and, and a melody with your words? I guess it became sort of um, a compulsive desire for me to become the joy of, in my father's life, you know, um, to generate uh, pride and, and to bring happiness to his life and to uh, vindicate his his spirit in some sort of way that's I guess that was I guess my first motivation to succeed in life now that I look back and also like I said before through therapy because I, I analyze myself I've been doing, going to an analysis to my analyst for almost eight years he doesn't want to see me anymore <laughs> he's done with me I think but um, it's a great thing and and uh, yeah I've, I've discovered all these things um, they are sort of private, but I think that I, I can I can speak openly about that because there's yeah, there's nothing really um, uh, 
forbidden in, in, in this in this uh, in this sentiment you know I guess that we all have some sort of motivation that is very that lies at a very subconscious level and I think one of them was to uh, for me at least was to was to bring joy to my parents how do they feel about your success um, and now that you are so hugely successful has it brought them joy? Has it brought them anxiety? What has it brought them? I think many satisfactions. I've always been very close to my family. I'm, I'm very homey. I, 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 I have an Oedipus complex that I haven't been able to, re, re, <laughs> to resolve with my dad. I absolutely adore my dad. He's, Maybe you shouldn't get rid of that therapist 70. just yet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> But uh, he's 78, and but he's so lovely. He's always been so loving and 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 caring. And my mother as well. She's just um, unbelievable. Um, they have both been there for me, supporting uh, my 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 wishes to to succeed and and uh, encouraging my talents and discovering my potentials and and um, really unlocking them. Um, my mother was the first person who actually um, put in my head the idea of, you know, really going, pursuing this career, you know. He, he, she, she asked me very respectfully, she asked me once when I was 10 years old if I wanted to, to participate in a music contest. And I said to her, give me a day, I need to think about it. Then the next day I said to her, you know what, I think I'm ready, I'm going to do this. And that was the turning point. That, a, a, a really determining mo moment in my life, you know. Uh, from that moment on, I decided I wanted to become a professional singer, and so I, I invested every um, every bit of effort and energy into that goal. How worried were you growing up that, despite all your extraordinary talents and encouragement by your parents, that you would enjoy music, but you would never, quote unquote, make it sort of um, in a way that you clearly have today. Were you nervous about that? And why do you think, why do you think it all came together for you? Why? Lots of hard work, lots of determination. I consider myself a, a laborer of what I do, uh, an artisan. And I think I've been building my career putting a brick over a brick under the sun with sweat and hard work. That's the way I've done it. And I haven't given up, uh, not one moment. And there must, there must be something very abnormal about this because it's been so many years doing this and I still care so much. And I don't think that's normal, you know, but with every project, I feel that I haven't accomplished anything, that I feel that I'm starting from zero and I care tremendously in a way that sometimes it surprises me. So you feel like I'm you have to there. prove yourself over and over again? Yes, I, I think that I have to be, um, that I have to embrace new challenges and, and, and those challenges uh, make me grow and growing is the only way to go and the only way to, I conceive life, you know. So yeah, that's the way I see it. How are you inspired to write music or decide when a song really, you connect with a song? How does that whole process work? Uh, you know, I've been writing songs since I was eight years old and it's still very difficult for me to comprehend how the whole um, creative process uh, takes place. I guess many images navigate in my subconscious mind for days and days and until they I see them arrive to a good harbor <laughs> the good port and and they they become concrete and um, sometimes my songs are like before they become songs they're just like codes that I cannot even trans secret codes I cannot even translate or recognize myself you know um, it's it's really mysterious and magical at the same time. Um, Do you see things, Shakira, outside? Does someone say something to you mm -hmm. and you remember a phrase or is it all sorts of different ways that it comes to you? I, get, I guess you collect impressions from people, from life, from experiences, from, uh, from your friends' experiences, from your own daydreams and fantasies. 
as well. <laughs> <laughs> this particular album has been written from a very feminine perspective. I don't know, maybe because I feel more like a woman today. Um, yeah, and, and it has a lot to do with my views, the way I see the world, the way I see things, the way I see myself. It has a lot to do with my self-image, but also with um, anecdotes and stories that are not necessarily mine, that maybe I've, I've, uh, I've been in touch with, you know, my friends, they go through so many things, you know. I have a group of 30-year-old friends <laughs> that, uh, that struggle through, you know, through, through what, it, what it really means being a woman, you know, um, in your 30s and, 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 and feeling fabulous, but not being able to find the right man, you know, and, and wondering why is this so difficult? Why, uh, you know, where are all the men in this town? <laughs> You're That's actually the title of one of my songs. <laughs> You're kind of the Colombian Carrie Bradshaw. <laughs> I'm starting to feel that way now in the, with some of these songs. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I guess you could you could say that it's a little Sex in the City. I mean. It, and that's, I think that's uh, why that show was successful, because in a way it portrays a reality very accessible to all of us, you know? Well, I've been in a relationship for nine years, but I have many friends who, who are still searching, and it's difficult. Um, but I think there is a someone for every person. I think so. We just have to be receptive, and sometimes we we block our own desires or we're not in touch with our deepest and, um, and, and, and hidden desires. Or we have expectations that are formed by other people and not ourselves. Yeah, or we try to fulfill other people's desires, right? Rather than our own. Um, yeah, and, and w that's why it feels so good to grow up and, you know, and, and feel, when I was saying to you before that I feel more like a woman today, I, I guess I feel more in touch with, um, with my own desires and, and a little freer as well. Um, a little bit more like the owner of my own life and that is a good feeling. You, I think, in many ways are about empowering women and yet you're also a very sexual woman and your songs are very I think sensual and your performance is very very sensual too and how do you how do you combine those two wishes you know you want women to be super strong and yet not objectified necessarily Absolutely. so how do you how do those things mesh together I think that I'm gonna answer you with uh, that spinal tap famous quote <laughs> Have you watched Spinal Tap? I have, but not for a long time, so I have no idea what What's quote you're going to tell sexy? me. What's wrong with being sexy? What? What's wrong with being sexy? <laughs> yeah. No, actually, I feel that, um, yeah, sexy is good, as long as it's, it's not the main recipe, it's an ingredient in a very hot plate, you know? <laughs> I feel that... Um, that there's nothing wrong with a woman feeling um, confident about her own sensuality and feel freer to express herself uh, in any way that she really and truly desires. Um, but I, I think that I would not dare to, you know, appear in a leotard in a video if I would not have other dimensions to my life that complete me as a woman, yeah. I, I feel that I'm not unidimensional. I, I have many, many layers and many things to say and many thoughts to share. It's not all about looking pretty in a video. That's the last thing, you know. Actually, before I did the She Wolf video, for example, I had to write a song, produce it, arrange it in the studio, of course, with, with other other people who, who helped out immensely, and, and then mix it for a whole month because I wasn't happy with the sound yet until, until I finally got satisfied <laughs> with it. But it was a whole process of almost craftman craftsmanship um, and filigrane, you know, and getting really deeply into, into the details. 
of this song uh, creatively and intellectually. And after I put all of those efforts into this song, then I wrote the treatment for the video and then I put myself in the golden cage and split and opened up my legs <laughs> and, and did all those things that can be considered sexy, but for me are only a, an expression, an expression of my humanity, an expression of my femininity, also an expression of my views. So that was the last thing. The last persons we, the last people that, that, that we called was, were the, the hair and makeup people. They were, they were the last ones to arrive, you know, <laughs> before that. <laughs> there was a whole process of uh, intellectual and, and creative uh, development. You say you're not unidimensional or one-dimensional, I guess is what you might say as well. But do you, do you worry ever, Shakira, that the packaging and the being provocative and sexy might overshadow or make people think you don't have a lot to say, you're not a thinking, because I think you're a very, very intelligent person. Oh, thank you. And um, everyone says that, actually, about you, how highly intelligent you are. And I'm wondering if, if you worry that people can't accept s someone being this intelligent and, and with the other stuff um, accompanying mm -hmm. it. Is that making any sense at all? Absolutely, yeah, I, I absolutely get what you say. Um, I don't worry because I, I, I know myself very well. Well, I'm, I'm still in the process of getting to know myself even better, but I, I, I have developed a certain confidence and self-acceptance of who I am. Um, I know what I stand for. And as long as I'm sure about all these things um, and my values and, uh, and the things I believe in passionately, I don't think that the photo session could, can change all that. And, flip it upside down, you know. I, I think my world has really uh, solid roots. Um, my family, uh, for example, who are, are, are the most uh, important uh, thing in my life, uh, and my loved ones, of course, they are there to contain me, to, to, to bring sanity <laughs> to this crazy life. You know how show business can, can get. You know, and um, am I worried about the image? No, I'm, I'm, I'm more worried now about being true to myself and being honest. And you know, maybe 10 years ago, I would have not done a video like She Wolf, but now it's something I feel like doing, you know? So why am I gonna deprive myself from, or deny myself the possibility of expressing uh, the way I feel? I want to express myself freely. I don't, I don't want to be in a golden cage anymore. I don't want to be put behind bars. Um, I think we, this life is so brief and, and we spend it sometimes imposing over ourselves so many limitations uh, and obstacles that don't allow us to grow as, as we would like to, you know? And, and yes, I, I feel, you know, very much like a woman and this time around, I. I wanted to show my legs. I never showed my legs to it, you know, for 20 years. <laughs> and uh, I, always, I always did all my performances with long pants. And um, believe, believe it or not, I never showed my legs. And one day I looked at them and I said, hey, they're not bad. They're kind of short, but they take me to places. I think it's now or never, you know. <laughs> so I did it. And uh, I guess to abbreviate this very long answer, <laughs> I'm sorry about no, that. No, that's uh, okay. Uh, I, I think that it, it's, it's, it's about time to really embrace my individuality and my freedom as a, as a woman, as a person. And that's a message that I encourage uh, to other women. And, and that doesn't mean necessarily letting yourself be objectified because that means satisfying the desires of other people. You know, I say satisfy your own desires, you know, and live your life to the fullest because it's short. Let me ask you, um, and then I want to get into all your efforts with education, but you said this, this latest album really reflects who you are, your view of the world, how you see yourself, and how you see kind of others as well. If you had to say, in a nutshell, sort of how you're feeling about the world right now and how this 
the, your latest music reflects it. Could you? I think we've made enormous progress. Um, I think the world is a better is in a better place today than 200 years ago, for sure. Um, I think that after the Industrial Revolution, uh, you know, the the the, the middle class uh, uh, emerged. Uh, many more jobs were created. Uh, we are right now in a place where discrimination is downhill with Obama as a president. Uh, we have an amazing uh, example of a woman in the, in the White House. Um, I think that individual liberties and, and civil rights are, are, are now occupying a more important place. The world and, and, and the young people especially are more uh, engaged. Uh, I see young people every time being more proactive. I see social activism. Uh, this is a, an active generation, not like my parents' generation that was a little bit more passive. They say that every generation there is a passive and an active one, and I think that this one is really, really active, and, and I'm, I'm very optimistic about things. I'd like to, of course, we have a lot to work on, many, many goals to, to meet, and at the same time, recognizing how much progress we've made since the Middle Ages <laughs> to now, I also see that there are millions of people who live in poverty. Half of the world popula population live under $2 a day. And millions of kids in the world, 70 million kids, ab about 70 million kids, don't have any access to any kind of primary, edu primary education. So while that still happens, I still feel that we are prehistoric people, you know. <laughs> so yes, we have gotten to a much better place, but there is still so much more to fight for because if there is a kid in the world that is hungry, then we should we shouldn't consider ourselves more evolved than than I don't know. Uh, homo habilis, I don't know, or someone from the, the, the Paleolithic era, I don't know. I think that, that we still have to defeat poverty, defeat hungry, hunger in the world, consider, to consider ourselves really evolved creatures. You have focused a lot on eradicating poverty and promoting education for kids. Tell me about your work and what you have focused on? Um, yeah, I've, uh, since I was 18 years old, I decided to um, establish a foundation in Colombia called uh, Barefoot Foundation, Pies Descalzos. And since then, we've been focusing on education, uh, on providing uh, not only high quality education for the kids, but also a nutritional component food, food in school which to me is really the key to create an incentive for the parents to send their kids to school. Uh, t and, and really I've noticed and I've, I've, I've seen a witness of how this, this model really, really works. Um, school dropouts uh, decrease considerably, um, malnutrition as well. Uh, and because you know, we know that, that that a kid with an empty stomach cannot cannot learn. You know, so so we insist on providing food in schools, and um, our model insists as well in 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 making sure that our schools have their doors open to the community, because in most of the places where we are in Colombia, these are areas that have been devastated by poverty, extreme poverty and violence, and, and there has been a lack of a state presence 
throughout many, many years. So we try to be there as not only as a school, but also as a community center. So the parents also get receive um, psychological support and, and, and occupational training. And we share our sports facilities with the entire community and thousands and thousands of youngsters. Can, can benefit from that, not only the, the kids who actually attend to school. So uh, this has been uh, an experience that has given me so many satisfactions and um, it's really undescriptable. Um, and it's something I like to share because I know that it really works. I know, and I, because I've seen it over the years, that, that education really transforms the lives of not only the kids but also their families. and entire communities. Did your parents emphasize education a lot as when you were growing up and did they also uh, encourage you once you started becoming successful to give back to your community or to your country? I mean where does this, you could be shopping and having lunch and ha hanging out with your friends. And I also do a little bit of that. No, 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 but, but I mean all, all, all of that. I mean you could have um, a pretty easy life, I mean, uh, aside from your very hard work. And I'm, I'm curious why, what makes some people really want to channel that energy into helping other people? Is it, is it something your parents instilled in you? Is it just a realization you always had? I think there was, there was a moment that was sort of a turning point in my life. When I was seven or eight years old, uh, my dad went bankrupt. He lost his business. Um, and I remember that he sent us both, my mother and me, to Los Angeles for a few months, a couple months, while he liquidated his business. When we, when we got back to Colombia, um, I will never forget the day that I entered our apartment and all the furniture was gone, uh, the, the color TV, now it was uh, a black and white TV, uh, the fancy bed was now just a, a mattress, <laughs> everything was gone. There were the two cars that we had gone, um, and it was very upsetting to me. I was so pissed. I couldn't. I in my seven-year-old mind, I couldn't um, digest that all that information very easily. Uh, I was blaming my parents for that, and then they took me to the park. They decided to take me to the park where all the orphans and, and kids. Uh, um, who, who are very poor and, and live a lives in a complete abandonment uh, where, and, and, and they, they, they sniff glue to, to sort of forget. deal with and forget <laughs> and deal with the tragedy of their lives. So and they wanted to show me that there was another reality much worse than mine. And that left such an impression, such a mark in my impressionable mind that when I, um, that I decided, I decided that day. I decided that I had, I had a, a serious task in my life. I had to succeed for two reasons. One, because I had to vindicate my parents' social and economic position, and second, because I I felt that I had that I needed to do something about those kids if I ever achieved that, if I ever succeeded. So when I was 18, and I had my first big international success in Latin America, uh, I decided to establish my foundation. So it was the same year that the same year that that I did my first Latin American tour. That was that I that I decided to um, to to put together a foundation in Colombia. So you know, I guess in some sort of way, it, all, it also became a, a compulsion and a commitment, a very deep commitment. Um, and like I said before, something that has brought me one of the biggest satisfactions and joy, joys in my life because it is really wonderful to see these kids going to school, sometimes Saturdays and Sundays. They don't even have to go. They don't have to go Saturdays and Sundays, of course, but they just love it so much. They enjoy being in their school because it's a beautiful place where they can play, where they can learn, uh, where they feel that they matter, you know, that they're relevant to society and that they have an opportunity that they can grab onto and, and fight for a dignified future. They know that that's the one opportunity they have. 
and I know that sometimes we do take education for granted, you know, especially in the developed world, we do. We forget about how, how important it is for those who don't have it, who, do, who don't have an access to that. Um, and, you know, in countries like mine, education sometimes is considered a luxury when it should be a birthright. That's very well put. Um, you took a history of Western civilization class at UCLA. <laughs> And uh, I understand you absolutely love reading about history. I do. Are you? Do you feel like you're constantly trying to learn all you can about everything you can? Yeah, I am. I am. I love learning. Um, uh, yeah. Right now, I'm, I'm reading a, a book uh, of this author Wilkie Collins, who's a contemporary of um, Dickens, mm -hmm. and is quite a discovery. What a great book! Um, I'm reading it in Spanish, though. It's La Dama de Blanco. In English, I guess it's Lady in White or something like that. It's a beautiful book. It's not history, but, but That's in a, a historical frame. History, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, rec I highly recommend that book. Oh, my God. I don't know why he's not as famous. He, he wasn't as famous as, as, as Dickens. But I don't he know. Because he's just as good. Really? Yeah, All right, we'll really have to good. look into that. Please I'm going to have to do. Google. You love it. You Google love it. that. It's really well written. So I'm reading that, and also occasionally I'm reading this compilation from the New York Times. I think it's, for, it's something uh, called a uh, compilation from New York Times for Is the Curious the, Mind or something. Oh, op, are they op eds that are all yeah, opinion pieces from the? Um, I think it's mostly general knowledge and oh, okay. different, different topics from history to architecture to. Um, dance and arts and uh, music, yeah. but always from, the his from a historical sort of angle. So I like it. I like it really very much. You have been um, dating the same fellow <laughs> from 87, <laughs> asking it that way, <laughs> for nine years. And, um, and I know you have said you'd love to have kids, but you don't want to get married. You said, quote, if it ain't bro broke, why fix it? Why not ever think about getting married? Um, I'm going to answer. You, 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 gonna you, answer your mom and dad bit. are happy, yes? Yes, they're, they're happy. And they got married later on in their lives, too. Um, uh, so, yeah, I wasn't conceived under uh, the institution of marriage. I guess that has a lot to do with it, too. But um, I'm going to answer you with a very American saying, why fix what's not broken, right? So <laughs> in this case, uh, yeah, I've been with, with Antonio for nine years already. Uh, we function as a married couple. He's my partner in life. We are committed for life. Um, and we don't feel that an institution or a written document is going to unite us or bring us any closer than what we already are. If anything, what if it does exactly the opposite? So it's quite scary, you know. Relationships are so... Uh, vulnerable in a way to to these changes so I guess I'm, I'm happy the way we are and uh, I, I like to consider myself his eternal girlfriend you know it's, it's, it's very romantic when you think about it that way you know but you uh, would but like I do want to have kids with yeah him. yeah 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 we do want to have kids and I think maybe after this this tour we're gonna start a world tour next year and right after that I guess we're gonna uh, concentrate on that a little bit. He's very involved in all your humanitarian efforts. I mean, you are a team when it comes to the work that you've done and continue to do. Yes, he is very involved. Um, we both uh, are, we're both co-founders of this other organization in Latin America called ALAS, which works for early childhood development initiatives. And this is a totally different work from Barefoot, my foundation. What we try to do with this is to um, to deal with the heads of states in Latin America and try to <clears throat> uh, promote and advocate early childhood uh, development initiatives and make sure that this becomes part of their political agendas and that is at the top of their priorities. Because in Latin America, there are 35 million kids who don't receive any kind of stimulation, education, or, or nutrition uh, in their most critical years of their lives, you know, from zero to six years old. You, you know, you're a mother, you know how important it is to, to feed our children 
uh, and to Especially stimulate them. Especially as their them. brains are developing so quickly. Exactly. And we all, all only have that small window from zero to six. After six years old, the, the brain is developed, the social skills are developed, the motor skills as well. So this is the very small frame that we have to work with them. And, and, um, and we want to make sure that this becomes uh, an important part of political agendas of every single Latin American leader. So we're going next uh, 30th of November, we're going to Portugal to the, to the next uh, IB or American summit, presidential summit, and um, we're gonna, we're working really hard with Jeffrey Sachs and oh, yeah. University of Columbia to put together a regional alliance in which every president of Latin America will commit to, to make uh, early childhood development initiatives and programs a real, um, a real priority. So that's, that's what we focus on. That's great, <laughs> and it's, it's great to be able to use your success in such a positive way to help so many other people. I mean, it's a real gift for you and for everybody you help. We yeah, have some and it's also a, a duty, a, a responsibility. I think, you know, because I'm out there and, uh, and I have cameras on me. Why not speak about things that are more relevant than my own work? I mean, if, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I can learn about those issues and I can share what I've seen growing up in the developing world, and I can share also the solution part, because I, I know what works, um, at least in the field of education, because that's where I've concentrated all my energies almost half of my life. So I want to share that experience and, the, and those anecdotes and those success stories, um, because I, I, I really believe that poverty can be eradicated. We just need the commitment of government, but also the civil society. Here are some questions from Glamour readers. Uh, one writes, that she heard a story about a school teacher of yours who didn't let you sing in the choir because she thought you couldn't sing. She writes, obviously the teacher was wrong, but how did you find the strength to overcome the people who did not believe in you? First of all, is that a true story? That is a true story, actually, yeah. There was, there was a, a school teacher, the, actually the, the, the music teacher, in my school who didn't who didn't like the way I sang you know he, he thought that my vibrato was too pronounced um, for the choir it wasn't it, my voice would not work with the rest of the choir and and that I sang like a goat he actually said that that you know your vibrato is like a goat it's like like a goat vibrato you know how they go eh, that kind of thing so um, <laughs> Yeah, it was kind of devastating. <laughs> How old were you? I so wanted to be a part of that choir. I was like nine years old or 10. Um, and so I, I told my parents about it and they're like, my dad was like, you never get rid of that vibrato because a voice without a vibrato is worthless. So you stick to that vibrato and I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, dad. Uh, okay, dad. <laughs> but um, my parents both, really, really believed in me, and that was enough. And I like to s insist on that because there are so many kids out there with so much talent, and, and they just need their parents to be able to notice them and encourage them. That's all a kid needs. You know? Did you ever run into that guy, the choir director? I did, actually, because uh, then a few months after that happens, I decided to participate in this music contest that my mother suggested to me, and I won. So I took my little trophy and I took it to school and I rubbed it on his nose like this. <laughs> what did and I say? So what, that's what I said to him. What do you say now? And he was like, uh, I don't remember what he said actually. I just very <laughs> vividly remember me with my trophy walking it all throughout school. Um, and then the, the, the nuns in my school, they wanted me to join the choir and I said, no, no, I'm not interested. You know, that's kind of you showed the way them. It was. Yeah, <laughs> many many <laughs> times over. Here's another question. I think many people might want to know the answer to this question. How do you get your hips to move like that? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I'm not a trained dancer, um, but I do know that I grew up in a city that revolves around dance. Dance is such an important part of our culture. I, I see so many kids who are so good with their bodies and the way they, they, they move to music. I think that I was just one of those kids. 
you know. Uh, I you think love, I, I you learned how to dance, dance even before I, I learned how to walk. <laughs> That's an exaggeration, of course, but, but yeah, I've been dancing my entire life. And you must love it, clearly. I do. I do love it. Um, yeah, especially I like to think that, you know, I, of course, I only have one body and four limbs. And with this one body that, I, that I've been given, I have so many infinite possibilities, you know. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, that's what dance offers you. Dance, I have such a respect and fascination for dance and, uh, and how your body can become a vehicle and a channel through your, to your emotions and to so many sentiments and even thoughts. Um, I, can, I can pretend to be a bird. I can pretend to be a lion or a she-wolf. You know? <laughs> I can pretend to be light as air or, or I can... I can really own gravity and stay grounded as I move through the space. I, I mean, dance is really another universe that I have so much fascination with. Um, four, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Fascination four. <laughs> and finally, uh, this glamour reader, my 18-year-old daughter, Ellie, is completely fixated on your abs. Oh. I mean, she thinks you're amazing. And my daughter, Carrie, Sounds just like you. Not really yeah. as good as you, but she does. She mimics you singing um, she underneath your clothes. Really? Yeah. I wanted to record it and bring it because oh, it is so funny, but she's very shy and I couldn't get her to do it. But maybe oh. sometime I'll send it to you because you'll, you'll get a kick her. out of it. I would love to see that. <laughs> so cute. But um, so I, I guess a lot of glamour readers want to know this, not just my daughter, <laughs> Ellie, but you are in incredible shape. Is it because of dancing? Is it a certain lifestyle you lead? Or what kinds of things do you do? Do you, uh, mm. you know, do sit-ups? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> I do now. Um, I wasn't very disciplined with fitness. Uh, you know, working out wasn't a priority before in my life. Um, uh, and only with my, you know, with my live performances. I, I used to think that that was enough. Now is not enough anymore. <laughs> so now I, I think I'm starting to, to take fitness a little bit more seriously. And I'm making a commitment to, you know, live a very healthy life as much as I can. I love chocolate. That's like my weakness, you know. I'm like a chocolate addict. That's, that's the only addiction I have, <laughs> really. But, but so, so I have, to, if I want to eat chocolates, I'm going to have to, you know, uh, invest a little more time in, 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 in fitness, working out and stuff like that. So what I usually do is just like dance aerobics, 40 minutes a day, um, and some sit-ups, yeah, for 10 minutes of abs <laughs> at work, and, uh, and then arms, free arms, you know, I don't, I barely use weights. Um, and that's about it, you know, a little bit of legs as well. <laughs> It's like an hour and a half workout. Wow. Well, every day you do that. I try. I, I haven't done it that consistently since I started the promo. But just performing But I did it right work. before the video. I really wanted to look decent for that video, so I, I really tried hard. And just performing is a good workout for it you. It is. Absolutely. It's the best. Dancing is the best performance. I did, I'm sorry, the best workout ever. It really is. And once again, you can read portions of my interview with Shakira in the January issue of Glamour Magazine. Thank you for watching, and now stay tuned for a message from our sponsor, Dove.